All right, we have an ask the pastor question that I'm going to touch on hopefully fairly quickly. Uh, the question is, how do we know what laws written in the Old Testament we are required to obey now? Read Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Galatians. <laughs> there you go. Uh, simply put, let, let, let's see if I can break this down a little bit. The way I see it, when God gave uh, Israel the law, uh, the first five books of, of uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, uh, the books of the law, he, he gave laws in four areas. Now this is, this is my thinking. I'm sure if you go out and look, you'll find people that disagree and have either more or less. But the, the way I see it, there are four areas that God has given them law. Uh, he's given them a moral law. Uh, this is to help them understand the nature of who God is and how far removed from him man has become. All right? Uh, kind of jointly with that, he has given them um, civil laws. Now, it's interesting because if you look at the Ten Commandments, the kind of the core of what God had given to the, to the people of Israel as their laws, uh, they, they exist in two areas. The first is how um, man will relate with God. And then the second area is how man relates with each other. Okay? And, and that kind of is, is two areas that God has given law. As a matter of fact, um, when Jesus was talking with the Pharisee, and he said, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, well, you know, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and mind. And, and, but then he said, and the second is like to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, all of the law and the prophets hangs on these two. Okay? So how you love God and how you love your fellow man, that's really the, the underpinning of the law. But God also gave them a couple um, other areas. Uh, so we've got um, moral law and we've got civil law. Uh, but then he's also given them the, the religious law. And this is the, the requirements that God expects of them as to how they will proceed in their life. And this, this is things like the, the, um, the vestments that the priest would wear. Um, these are things like what sacrifices are required for sin, for a free will offering, for uh, a wave offering. Um, and, and, and those are things that kind of regulate how the religious life of Israel went. So that, there's three areas. And then there's a fourth area that I see that, that you, you can kind of weave in and out of these other areas. But it really stands on its own. And that's the, the law of peculiarity. That's what I call it, the peculiar laws. When God called Israel to be his chosen people, he called them out. We call this the process of sanctification, the holiness. He called them out of the profane, and he made them holy. He took them from the common, and he made them unique. And as part of this, God wanted them readily identifiable to the people around them as being different. Okay, because other, other countries... Uh, other civilizations, other cultures, they had their laws, okay? And so, uh, does anybody here know about the, the still of um, uh, Hammurabi? The still of Hammurabi. Anybody familiar with that? Okay. Um, the still of Hammurabi is from, the Hammurabi was a, uh, either a lawgiver or a law recorder uh, from the ancient civilization of Sumer, which is in the area that Ur was, Ur of the Chaldees. Um, this still, which is a, a cuneiform block, has written on it a series of laws, and it's the oldest record that we have of laws uh, dating back to way, 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 way back, okay? Um, and if you look at those laws, a lot of those laws are very similar to what God had given Israel, okay? So other countries had laws. They had rules that governed how we're going to operate, how we exist, and how we interact with our gods. But then God also gave to Israel the, the peculiar laws. And those were laws with things like um, don't wear any garment woven of two different material. Don't plant in one field two different types of seed. Don't trim the edges of your beard. 
um, put tassels on the corners of your robe. These are laws that are peculiar laws, not because they're weird. I mean, we look at them and go, why is that? I mean, why does that even make sense? I think these laws were given so that they would be immediately recognizable as being different. Okay? When people saw a Jew, they should go, oh, oh okay, I, he, he's not like us. Okay? And those are the peculiar laws. Now, with the giving of the law, why, why was the law even given to Israel? Does anybody know? We're kind of looking at, at uh, Galatians, specifically about chapter 3. Galatians tells us that the law was put into effect to make us aware of our need for a Savior. It made us aware of sin. Paul goes so far as to say that if you, know, you didn't know that, that stealing was wrong, there was no law saying it was wrong, then it wouldn't be wrong. But now that you know that it's wrong, it's sin. Uh, James even goes so far to say as the law is one intact, complete unit. And if you break or violate any part of it, you've broken all of it. Okay? So, in the Old Testament, the, the law has been given. And we come up into the life and the ministry of Jesus. And as a matter of fact, Jesus says um, that not one jot or tittle will be changed until it is all fulfilled. Okay? So, how does that put us in a place where, I mean, I'm, I'm looking around and um, some of you have trimmed the edges of your beards. And I think almost everybody in here is wearing uh, clothing that has been made with more than one type of material. Um, you know, um, we're meeting together on Sunday, not Saturday. Why are we allowed, or are we allowed, to do these things and not be in violation of the laws, those, those laws that God has given us. Well, first we need to understand one thing. The law is not wrong. The law is not bad. The law is not sinful. It was put into a place, put into place to accomplish a particular purpose, to make us aware of sin, and by being aware of our sin, to see that we needed a way to be in a right relationship with a holy God. Okay? So Jesus comes. He says, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. All right? We're coming up on uh, Passover. We're coming up on Good Friday. Um, and, and thank God, not just Good Friday, but Resurrection Sunday. And we see the fulfillment of the law. Now... When we get into the New Testament, uh, the, the early church was made almost exclusively of Jews. Okay, Jesus was a Jew. The disciples were Jews. The apostles were Jews. The early church members were Jews. And then Jesus directed that they were to go out and, and take the gospel. What does gospel mean? Good news. Good news. Okay. Um, the good news, it's not good unless you understand that you're in a bad place. Okay? And, and they were to go out. They were to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. Okay? And well, when they got outside of Judea, there were less Jews and more Gentiles. And so the early church went through this upheaval. Uh, if you read in the book of Acts, you know, about 15, 16, chapter 15, chapter 16, it, it caused such an upheaval that they actually called together a council in Jerusalem to discuss these problems. Well, what were the problems? The problem was Gentiles were coming in, and they were receiving the same grace that the Jews who believed had received. How then were they supposed to act? Because if they wanted the fulfillment of what the Jews had received, do they then need to become proselytized Jews? Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to honor the Sabbath? Do they need to, are, trimming the beard? What, what all do we need to do here? And so you look in uh, the Council of Jerusalem. Uh, this is where we see uh, James, the Lord's brother, uh, was probably, if not the leader, most likely he was one that was given great respect because here's he says, here's what I think. 
He, they listened to Peter's explanation of being called to the Gentiles. They listened to Paul and Barnabas' explanation of all that had happened with the Gentiles that absolutely reflected and mirrored what had happened to the Jews at Pentecost. And, and so um, they said, well, okay, what do we do here? Okay, let's, let's make it easy for them so that this won't be a stumbling block. And they give them a list of commands. Well, of those commands, you know, they say, you know, don't eat uh, meat with the blood in it. Abstain from sexual immorality. They give them a list of three or four things that they're supposed to do. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I sit down to a steak, it's got to have juice. Okay? I don't like eating leather. Christy loves leather. And for years and years and years, we ate leather. And I didn't like steak. I happened to go somewhere and somebody made a steak and they made it medium and I thought I was in heaven. Okay? But, but why are we not subject to these rules? Well, let's look at a couple scriptures really quickly. And, and really to understand this, you've got to look at the book of Romans. You've got to look at 1 Corinthians, and you've got to look at Galatians. But I'm going to try and summarize this as, as quickly as I can. Um, Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 11. Flip over there with me, if you will. We're going to kind of be there for just a minute. And then I want to get on to our message today. Um, so Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Okay, Paul is writing to the Galatians. Um, the specific occasion for this book, this letter, was that there were uh, what are called Judaizers. Um, after the, the, the churches were founded in the area of Galatia, Galatia is in modern-day Turkey. And Galatia is not a city, it's a region, and there's a number of cities in the region. And when we think he's specifically speaking to four or five that are in the southern part of of Galatia because those were the places Paul went to on his first missionary journey, okay? Uh, so you have uh, Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. Um, I, we think that's probably who he's specifically writing to. We know churches were founded there under the ministry of Paul and Barnabas in the first missionary journey. Um, the problem was when they left, if you read the book of Acts, uh, look 11 through 13, you see Paul and Barnabas are going to these churches. And the first place they go when they come into the, the city, they go to the synagogue, right? They're Jews. That makes sense. They would go, they, because the Jews have the Bible at that time, the Hebrew Bible, and they would be able to speak to them understanding the same scriptures, all right? So they go into these synagogues, and at first the, the Jews in the synagogues receive it, and, and they're excited. But then as time goes on, some of the, the Jews kind of go, wait, 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 wait a minute, what do you mean? What do you mean we're free? What, 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 what is this thing? And, and, and they started stirring things up. And, and part of the problem was when they would speak in the synagogues, these Gentiles would hear this gospel and they would start showing up at the synagogue. And, well, they're not supposed to be here. They're not Jews. They don't have our beliefs. They don't have our law. They don't have our unique relationship with God. They shouldn't be here. And, and so what ends up happening is the Jews essentially chase Paul and Barnabas out of the city. All right? So they go up to the next city. They go to the synagogue. Guess what happens? Some Jews from the first city follow them, and they start stirring up people against them. And at, at some point, Paul and Barnabas finally say, Hey, look, you guys don't want to receive the word of God. The word that has been given to you, we're telling you the fulfillment of it. You don't want it. We, we are shaking the dust of our feet. We are leaving you, and we're going to the Gentiles. Now, keep in mind, Galatians chapter 1, Paul already knew this was going to happen. God already told him that he had called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. This was that prophecy, that promise being worked out. Okay? Well, the problem is, these Gentiles come into this new faith, which at this point is still a sect of Judaism, and they're coming in with all the garbage of their pagan lifestyle. Okay, and that's causing a lot of confusion because the Jews have the law and, and they're, how they're supposed to live their lives and interact with each other and interact with God. And these, these Gentiles don't know anything. They're ruining everything. Okay, well, they call the council at Jerusalem. They come together. They start talking about it. And, and Paul and, and Peter both say, hey, look, man, 
Everything that happened at Pentecost has happened to these Gentiles over and over and over again. How can we deny what God has very obviously done? So, in his writing in the book of Galatians, Paul is addressing the churches because the Judaizers are coming back in and they're saying, yeah, you know, you, you receive salvation on faith, but if you're going to be inheritors of it, snippy, snippy. There are certain laws that you have to obey. And, and Paul is writing to address this. As a matter of fact, he gets pretty hostile. In uh, chapter 5, he says, you know, those of the circumcision, he said, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. He's pretty ticked. Okay? That, that's not genteel, christian e speech going on here. He's like, man, you know, if, if you want to do snippy, snippy, don't stop at the foreskin. Cut it all off. <laughs> all right? So, in chapter 3, Paul uh, makes a comment. He says, uh, in verse 10, he says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Wait a minute. I thought the law was good. Yes, because it makes us aware of something. Curse be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of law and do them. Now look at verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law for, and then he quotes, the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not a faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them now listen to this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Okay? Now there's, I, I can't go into this deep enough today to, to really open this up. This is a huge, you know, all of scripture is gold. But every once in a while, you come across a nugget that you just pick up and it's like, wow! Okay? And, and, you know, the next time I read this passage, it'll probably be a different part. Okay? But this package right here is awesome. Because Paul understands that the law, not only does the law make us aware of sin, it also puts us under the burden and bondage of sin. Okay? Because we can't keep the law. We mess it up. We keep messing it up. As a matter of fact, you know, you look at the sacrifices that are required as sin offerings. If, you're, if you sin and you're aware of it, this is what you got to bring. And then once a year on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur, the high priest has to go and make a sacrifice for everyone. Okay? Hebrews makes it clear that if that blood could take away sin, we would not need another sacrifice, but another sacrifice was needed, and that was the perfect lamb, which was Jesus Christ, okay, once and for all. So how do we deal with this law then? Well, Paul makes it clear, we're not under the law. In 1 Corinthians, he says, you're not under the law, you're under grace. Great, fantastic. What does that mean? I mean, aren't, aren't there certain measures of behavior that we're required to, to exhibit and to have. I mean, you know, when you, you come into to church, you got to be happy. Isn't that a smile that's in here somewhere, right? On, when you get to church, you have to smile and act like everything's okay. Um, you know, and if you don't know the words to the song, then hum and, and at least look like you're worshiping instead of going, I have no idea what we're saying here. I don't know. I, I want to apologize to Scott and Cam because I wasn't really paying attention to the... To, I probably sang a whole bunch of different words than what you guys were singing, so my apologies uh, if I distracted you. But, um, you know, we have these rules uh, that govern how we re interact with each other and how we relate to God. So are we under the law or are we not? No. Yes. We are not under the law, the written law, the code that God has given. However... We are the inheritors of the promise that God spoke through the prophet that he would take away our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh. And then later it says, what's he going to do with that heart of flesh? He's going to write his commandments on them. Okay? This is the, 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 the working of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that... that um, any of you ever, all of a sudden, one day, just have a light bulb go off that something that you've been doing the majority of your life is sin? And you never knew it. You know, it, it just goes, <coughs> that's the Holy Spirit working these things out of you. Now, 
Throughout the New Testament, there are several places where Paul and Peter and James, they, they make lists of behaviors that are appropriate for Christians and behaviors that are not appropriate for Christians. As such, these are guidelines. These are like, like the sign on the side of the road that lets you know where you are. Okay? The Holy Spirit, if you have come to faith in Christ, you have His Holy Spirit living inside of you. It has sealed you unto Him for eternity. But we still have to learn what being holy looks like. One of the things that is, is most profound in my life, one of the teachings that has been most profound in my life, is that when a Christian sins, they're not living by the carnal nature. They're not living according to something that they are. They're living to something that is completely opposite to what you are. Because when you come to Christ, you're a new creation. The old is dead and gone. The new has come. And so when you are a, a, a new believer in, in faith in Jesus Christ and you sin, you are acting opposed to what you are. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner. Now I'm saved by grace. Sin is not inimical to the Christian life. That's something that is... It's like a, this, this parasite that has to be gotten rid of. All right? So when I sin, I'm acting opposite to who I am. Because Scripture says, I stand before God in righteousness. A righteousness not my own, but righteous. I am holy. He has taken me out of the profane. We say, oh, oh okay, but why, how come we're not perfect? Because we are still being perfected. As Scripture says, He has forever made holy those who are being perfected. Okay? Or, or you can actually... Flip those two words around and say, he is, he is forever perfected, those who are being made holy. Because when we stand before him, he's not looking at us. He's looking through the veil of the blood of Christ. And he sees that, that the, our price, the price for our sin is paid. Okay, So what are we object to under the law? None of it. But we are called to a much higher law. The law of the spirit. And that's where things, you know, you thought it was rough when you weren't allowed to commit murder, you weren't allowed to slander. Well, this, this new higher law, being that our very nature's changed, you're not allowed to think about hating someone. You're not allowed to dwell on the injuries and injustices with anger and malice to other people. You're not allowed to look lustfully at someone of the opposite gender or even somebody of the same gender, okay? This is, this is the, the, the nature of who we are. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. We become what he is and forsake what we were. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, write up is up here if anybody would like to look at it. Um, real quick, I want to hit something real quick. We have been on our journey <clears throat> to Jerusalem. We talked last week uh, about Jesus fulfilling the prophecy that he set his face as flint. Uh, this was written in Isaiah chapter 50. Um, it was fulfilled in Luke chapter 9, uh, Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look uh, back, Jesus is um, with the disciples up at um, Caesarea Philippi. If you look on a map, actually I have a map on there uh, of Israel. If you would uh, pull that up real quick. Um, if you look up at the Sea of Galilee, uh, just to the north of the Sea of Galilee is Mount Hermon, and just the other side of Mount Hermon is Caesarea Philippi. It was kind of a, a it was actually a very beautiful place, um, but there was a cave there that that they believed actually went down to, to Hades, down to where the dead go and where evil lived, and and there were. Uh, idols there. This was a place of worship for pagans for years and years and years. And first the Canaans, the Canaanites, and, and then uh, then later the Romans. Um, so if you look, um, oh, you really can't see it on here. Um, you see where it says uh, colonitis? That's right about the area um, that we're talking about. Um, but it's interesting, I, I bring this up because at this point, um, Jesus says, um, you know, upon this rock I will build my church. Um, we've heard a, a number of different thinkings as to what that is. Some think that it's, the, that it's Peter. Some think that it's the faith that Peter exhibited. Uh, I, I've heard a teaching that actually he was pointing out to this cave where these, uh, these altars and idols were set up because he said in the very gates of hell, 
they're looking at what was considered at that time to be a gateway to hell, shall not prevail against it. But what's interesting is after he says this, he begins to talk to, for the first time, he starts to tell the disciples about his true purpose on earth. <clears throat> the Son of Man is going to be given up to the Gentiles, and, and he will be abused, and he will be sacrificed, and, and he will die. And that's, that's the purpose that he's come. We, we kind of delved into that. Now, from this point on, we see that Jesus is telling the disciples and the apostles over and over again that his purpose here is that his life might be given as a ransom for many. Okay, it starts here. Now, we talked last week about his purpose. We talked about the fact that he set his face to Jerusalem. Uh, we see if uh, you look, do we have the little laser pointer? And does it work? Because that, that would make a difference. How do I work it? This one? Do it. All right, sweet. All right, so this area up here, Galilee. Uh, we see Jesus came down through, see Samaria right here? Samaria existed between Galilee and Judea. Samaria is where the Samaritans lived. They were the cast-offs. They were those that, uh, the Jews that were left behind that intermarried with the, the races that the Babylonians and the Assyrians brought in. They were thought by the Jews to be the lowest of the low because they had forsaken the law of their forefathers that they would not dilute the bloodline and they brought in on themselves a curse. And so uh, this is uh, when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, to, to us, that would be like um, the, the parable of the Good Isis warrior or something like that. That's, that's the disgust that they felt toward the Samaritans. Uh, if you look, you see that if you were living up in the Galilee area and you needed to get down here to, to Jerusalem, right there, you had to go through Samaria. Well, a, a good Jew wouldn't go through Samaria. So what they'd do is they would cross over the Jordan up here, and they'd come down the east side of the Jordan, and then cross over to Jericho, and then down to Bethany and over to Jerusalem. Um, now, if you look in the, the progression of your Bible, um, anybody know who lived in, in Bethany? Lazarus, Mary, Martha. Martha. Yeah, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And, and we see in the progression, especially in the book of John, that he comes into Bethany. Uh, actually, he's, he's over toward Jericho, and he gets word that Lazarus is sick. And, and um, even sick unto death. And, and, and Jesus tells him, well, it's not unto death. He, he'll be okay. Well, then he dies. Now, it's interesting because from the time he died to the time Jesus came, four days had transpired. Scripture is clear that four days had transpired. What's interesting about this in some of the Hebrew writings is that there was a belief that when a person died, their spirit stayed around the body for three days. Okay, and then on the fourth day it would depart. Okay, I, I think Jesus was speaking to the Jews. Um, we don't, he'd already raised people from the dead. I think this was him illustrating, hey, look, you, you think this is a, a miracle, this person is dead and their spirit's still around. I'm waiting until the spirit departs and calling him back. Okay, so he goes to Bethany, he does the miracle, he uh, then leaves, and he goes up, see right here, it says Ephraim. This is a, a town, it's in um, Samaria. And Jesus is actually hiding out. It says he goes to the wilderness and ended up in the town of Ephraim. Ephraim. And while he's there, you know, things are happening, transpiring. The Pharisees are looking for a way to kill him. And then he does this weird kind of journey because scripture tells us in John um, that it was six days to the Passover, and, and people were starting to go down for the Passover. Now, Jesus could have walked straight down to Jerusalem from here, but he doesn't do that. He goes over, comes down to Jericho, and there in Jericho, we see that he, uh, does anybody know anything of significance that happened in Jericho? little short guy. Zacchaeus is in, in there and, and Zacchaeus climbs a tree. You got to be desperate to climb a tree. 
And Jesus sees him and he calls him down. He says, you've got to come down. I'm staying at your house. You know, I mean, that's an entirely different culture than we have. But, but he comes down and, and he goes in and, and, you know, Zacchaeus was the head tax collector. And, and another way to understand that is the chief extorter. Because the way that the tax collectors worked is they were, there was a requirement that was required to be collected for Rome. And then anything you got above that, that was your salary. And so Jesus comes down and the Jews hated the tax collectors because these were Jews that had forsaken their, their betraying their countrymen and they're working on behalf of the Romans. Okay? They, they despise them. And here Jesus goes again because anybody know another tax collector that Jesus ate with? Yeah. Matthew. Okay, so this is the second time he goes into a tax collector's house and, and the, 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 the righteous people are offended. And, and Jesus says, hey, look, um, um, you know, Zacchaeus has said that, that I'm giving half of my wealth to the poor, and if I've robbed anyone, I will return unto him fourfold. I don't know how much he took from people, but obviously he was not in a bad place. Okay? But what was Jesus' response to Zacchaeus? He said, today salvation has come to this house. Why? Because when God gets a hold of you, when salvation comes, you change. Okay, so then Jesus leaves Jericho, and he follows the road across, and you can see Jericho right here, and he comes down here to Bethany. Now, he just made this huge circle. He went from Bethany, he came all the way up to uh, Ephraim, and then he circles around, comes through Jericho, and he comes to Bethany. Now, um, in Bethany, he's come back in, in uh, I believe it's John chapter 9, Lazarus has been raised. Now he makes this big circle and he comes back around and he comes to Bethany again. But Jesus knows that this trip is different than all the other trips where he's come through Bethany because this is the last one that he's coming on, on this, this part of his life until his life is over. And so he's coming in and he's eating at the house of Lazarus. Scripture says that he had been raised from the dead and, and uh, two peculiar things happen. The first is Mary takes a, a, a jar of spikenard, which is a, a very expensive perfume at the time. Uh, I had for a little while a little vial of spikenard. It, it smells beautiful. It's incredible. It's a little bit stronger than I like, um, but, but it's, it's a beautiful scent. And uh, she, she takes it and she anoints him. Well, the scripture says, in, in some of the Gospels, it says the disciples were offended. Uh, in John, it specifically says that Judas was offended and told Jesus, you know, why didn't we take this and sell it and we could give money to the poor? But then Scripture makes it very clear he wasn't interested in the poor. He was interested in lining his pockets. He's looking at the loss. He's thinking, man, this is money out of my pocket. Okay? So, but um, <clears throat> while he's there... There's a second peculiar thing that happens. All of these people hear that the, the, that the man that has raised Lazarus from the dead is back. And they all start coming. They start flocking to this house to hear his teaching, to see if he'll touch them, to, to see how he will minister. Now, think about this for just a minute, okay? Jesus is on his way to the cross. And people are still coming to him in need. What does he do? So you go, wait, hey, man, look, oh, man, I have troubles of my own. If you guys knew what I know, you would not be asking me this. You would be coming asking if there was anything you could do to help me. But that's not what he does. He starts ministry. To them. Now, one of the, the, the lines in there that's really odd is because all of these people were coming and they were receiving from Jesus and they were following his teaching. The Pharisees, who had already determined, as a matter of fact, Caiaphas, uh, had, had already proclaimed that Jesus must die because it's better for one man to die on behalf of the nation than for the nation to die. Um, they, they're not only looking to take out Jesus, but they're also looking to take out Lazarus because he was raised from the dead. He's a living testimony to the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Okay? So they get into Jer to, to Bethany. They're having dinner. She anoints us, and it's really cool. Because Jesus says, do not reprimand her. 
because she has done a beautiful thing. She has saved this for the, my anointing of death. And he says, and wherever people speak of this, they will remember her. Everybody knows. Everybody in the church knows or should know about the woman that anointed Jesus for burial. Okay? He is proclaiming the truth that, that I mean, well, we know who she is today. The church knows who she is today. I think that's incredible. Jesus did nothing to diminish women. As a matter of fact, he oftentimes worked very hard to elevate them. So after they finish at Bethany, um, go ahead and go to the other map, if you would, please. I just want to show you real quick, because we're going to stop here today. <coughs> Our journey, if you look over on the right-hand side, you see where it says Bethany. Um, if you follow that red line, this is... Most likely the journey, the, the, the trip that Jesus took from Bethany into Jerusalem. Um, on the kind of the southeast side, uh, I'm sorry, the, the northeast side of the Mount of Olives sits a, a little village by the name of Bethphage. Jesus walks up to Bethphage. Bethphage is a Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem. Um, and he stops there. Does anybody know what he does in Bethphage? Not the, not the fig tree, no. He actually sends his disciples in to get a donkey. Jesus stops them. He doesn't go any further. He sends his disciples forward. He says, hey, you're going to find a, a donkey and a pole of a donkey tied, and, and I want you to take it and bring it to me, and if anybody asks, just tell them, hey, the master needs it. That would be something like, you know, somebody coming up to your house, climbing in your car, starting it up, and you're going, hey, hey, what are you doing? The master needs it. Oh, okay, sure, take it, by all means. Master who? You know, but that's, I mean, because a donkey was a significant investment at that time, okay? It's not something you've you got to keep in mind that in Israel there's very little arable land. Okay, and they want to use that for growing crops. So there's not a lot of land left over for cows and horses and donkeys. Okay, so to have a donkey, you were somebody. Okay, so Jesus stops at Bethphage and he sends his disciples forward to go get the donkey and they're going to bring it back and we're going to stop there today. Okay, because what happens next is Palm Sunday, and next week we're going to talk about Jesus coming down off the Mount of Olives, meek and riding on a donkey, and he's going to come into Jerusalem, okay, and, and we're going to delve into that a little bit as we build up, we build up, because the excitement, the pressure is mounting, the greatest event in the history of the world is getting ready to take place, and the pressure is building, and the pressure is building, and the pressure is building, and as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, uh, we're going to see some things that, that uh, you know, we're going to spend a little time on. And, and from that, uh, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. The Friday after that is uh, when we're going to do our Seder, the, the, the Passover meal. And, and we're going to build up to that. And, and I hope you guys will start getting in the Word and start getting a little of this excitement because as, as Jesus is coming in, He's coming in over Passover, and, and the Jews who believe, they believe incorrectly that He's coming to take the throne. Okay? So um, let's stop there. I would encourage you to uh, get into the book of John. Uh, after about chapter 9, just start reading in John. Uh, you can look in, in Matthew... Uh, chapters 20 and 21 uh, kind of gives you an, uh, an overview of it, but John is the one that really spends the most time talking about the build-up to the greatest event in the history of man. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. That, Father, through the travails of life, you have never left us. And that, Father, even as your son was headed toward the destiny that he knew was his, and even though the cross was in the way, he knew there was a glory on the other side. And as he went to the cross, he wasn't contemplating the, the loss of his life and, and the, the horror that was before him. And while that plagued his mind, he pressed on. He scorned the shame of the cross. 
and he went on our behalf. And we thank you, Father. And I ask, Father, that your spirit would quicken in us this week the, the, the miracle of salvation. And that, Father, as we look into your word and we see all that you did in preparation for this event and all that we are inheritors and receivers of, Father, I ask that you would light a fire in us, an excitement, Father, that we would not be able to keep our mouths shut. We thank you today, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.